so much uh, for having us here today. We're both de delighted to be here and uh, to tell you about our project, uh, DigiHE. Uh, so this is a, a three-year project, um, and the objective of the project is to encourage self-reflection on digitally enhanced learning and teaching at European higher education institutions through peer learning, and also to um, encourage strategic approaches and uh, capacity building when it comes to digitally enhanced learning and teaching. Uh, we're co-funded by uh, the Erasmus uh, Plus program of the European Union, and we are a diverse uh, European consortium consisting of five institutions, um, so led by the European University Association, but we also have Dublin City University in Ireland. Uh, we also have the baden württemberg Cooperative State University in Germany, um, and Ulf is actually a part of uh, the consortium who just gave a presentation a while ago. We also have uh, the Vitalis Magnus University in Lithuania and the University of Yavaskla in Finland, and not to mention our three wonderful associate uh, partners. So um, we're going to tell you a little bit about the research that we carried out as part of this project, which consists of a survey on digitally enhanced learning and teaching in European higher education institutions as well as a review of self-assessment tools and frameworks um, aimed at reviewing uh, digitally enhanced learning uh, and teaching in higher education institutions. So without further ado, I'm going to hand you over to uh, the Director of the Higher Education Policy Unit at EUA, uh, Michael Gable. So the floor is yours, Michael. Thank you, Alison, and good afternoon, everybody. Um, so to tell you a bit about the survey, um, it's a data collection that we did in April to June 2020. And as you know yourself, that was a difficult time for higher education institutions. So uh, the survey went to institutional leadership and we asked them to indicate the status or the state of play before the crisis started, but we had some dedicated questions which ad address the impact of the COVID-19 crisis. Um, despite the challenging times, we received more than 360 responses, mainly from universities, but it's a bit diverse. So there are colleges in and also some open universities, specialized universities, and and and. Um, we managed to cover the what was at that time the entire European higher education area of 48 countries. And um, uh, as we conducted a similar survey already in 2014 and had also questions on digital learning in our trends reports in 2015 and 18, we actually uh, have also some longitudinal data and I will uh, show that to you now. So just, we can just here, due to time constraints, also just point out some key trends. And I think there are three main messages that I want to bring in here. So the first one is basically on how um, digitally enhanced learning is uh, provided at higher education institutions. And I think the main message here is that it has become much more mainstreamed and strategic than it was in 2014. So we have nowadays more than half of the institutions say that they have it uh, spread out across the institution. Um, in 2014, we just 63% said that they had institutional strategies which considered digital enhanced learning. Today, it's 88%. And uh, you can also see that we have detailed data on how support and coordination has become more centralized and shared uh, in the institution. So in 2014, we had many institutions which had it either at faculty level or had even individual people in charge of it. So this is becoming much more consolidated. Um, we also see a massive increase in the number of institutions that indicate that internal QA covers also digital learning, 51% compared to 23% in 2014. Well, you could argue this still leaves about half of the institutions without QA for our digital learning. But uh, 
40, another 41% mentioned that they actually are discussing on how to uh, get it quality assured. So, and overall, the responses that we got were actually quite positive, positive perceptions regarding the impact uh, that digital learning has on the quality of learning and teaching, for example, the take up of new methods, the enhancement uh, of learning and teaching, uh, the general transformation on learning and teaching, but also on how it positively impacts student learning and uh, also generally student and staff attitudes were rather positive towards uh, uh, digitally enhanced learning. As you can see here in the graph, the main uh, format of provision is still blended learning and it's unlikely to change. Um, so we see about the same number of institutions that provided already blended learning back in 2014. But what is relatively, what has changed is that it is, as I said, much more mainstream. And in some countries, it's now basically all universities which provide blended learning. Can I have the next slide? Or can I do that? Thank you. Another thing that has changed is that the purposes come out uh, more clearer than they came out in 2014. 2014 was probably still a period where there was a lot of experimentation with different formats and ways of provision. Um, basically, we see not a massive increase in the number of online degree or in the number of institutions which provide online degrees. That's the same in 2014. The numbers of institutions which provide MOOCs has slightly increased. Uh, for short non-degree courses, there's a lot of talk about micro-credentials nowadays. Um, we asked the question for the first time, and as you see here, it's 50% of institutions which provide them. But what is really interesting is that um, they are there, there is a clear purpose now, which was not so clearly uh, recognizable back in 2014. And as you can see, it's this example is just on lifelong learning and uh, social inclusion. And it's about half of the institutions which state that digitalization has effectively contributed to a major transformation in widening access. 49% reach out to new learner groups. Uh, and this is also one of the main motivations for MOOCs. And uh, there is also a, a general impression that there is a growing demand for short courses. Um, so in blended mood mainly, but also in online and partly also on campus. And there is a relatively high number, I think it's around 40%, which also think that uh, this might to some extent ex uh, replace the current master degrees. And 65% target uh, lifelong learners uh, through online learning. 81% uh, see uh, digital learning as a way to widening access through digitalization uh, as a strategic uh, development priority. So the purpose for and added value of digital learning is much better defined as it used to be. I could have brought another example on internationalization where we also see, I think, a major change. Can I have the next one, please? Um, support and infrastructure. That's an interesting one also because we uh, collected data in the period of the in, in the in the time of the crisis. If you ask institutions just what they have in place, and this is just one of many several uh, data sets that we have on infrastructure and support for staff and students. If you ask them about what they provide, uh, as you can see, you get uh, relatively high numbers. Uh, it's three quarters basically, which provide personalized study portals. Uh, campus licenses, online repositories, online library services, and so on. So, but if you ask, if you go a bit more into detail and challenge that 
the 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 quality then that is there and the actual capacity then you get a different picture and i will pull that out at two examples one is the enhancement uh, uh one is the open library access where as you can see here 90 percent state that they have it in place but asked about what measures they started immediately in the time when, when the COVID crisis started that was effectively for 65% of institutions enhancing uh, the library, the open library access capacity. So clearly um, support and infrastructure are in place, but they may not be uh, sufficient for all staff and for all students. And actually to take out a second example, um, as you see stated here, 80% of institutions uh, indicate to have an online repository for educational materials. We got a similar answer already in 2014, but we have been asking us how useful are these? And this is actually a question that we want to address to you now. So I think we should get a poll question now. The question is coming up. Yes. So does your institution have a or several repositories for educational materials? And there you have a number of answer options, which are almost too small for me to read out. I hope you can read them. <laughs> I'll help you and I'll also say them in Romanian if I can. That's perfect. I'm sure so, that you do that better than I could have done that. <laughs> yes, and they are good and frequently used. Da, și sunt bune și le utilizăm des. A doua, yes, and they are used but need improvement. Da, sunt, le folosim, dar necesită îmbunătățire. A treia, yes, but they are hardly used. Da, dar le folosim rar. A patra opțiune, no, but there are other open repositories uh, at national level that can be used. Nu, dar sunt alte resurse educaționale și biblioteci digitale la nivel național pe care le folosim. A cincea, no, I don't know, nu știu și nu. Și ultima, bineînțeles, dacă sunt alte opțiuni pe care vă rugăm să le scrieți în chat. Deci pe menti.com cu 6327137. Michael? Yes. Very good. The answers are coming in. At the moment, it seems most colleagues have access to repositories, but also feel that they need to be improved. Okay. I'm not sure if we are still getting some. Uh, there should be more than 300 people in the room. And so far we have about some 30 responses. Otherwise, can we continue and look at this afterwards? Yes, you can. So, Alison, yeah. then I hand there. over to Alison so we don't lose time. So you can still answer it, but we will continue the presentation and we look at it in the end again. Okay, perfect. Um, I'm not muted. Okay, so this is where we were, right? <laughs> um, thank you very much, uh, Michael. Yes, so um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the desk research part of the project. Um, and this involved conducting a review of self-assessment tools and frameworks or instruments, um, which are used by higher education institutions to review the state of play of digitalization in their institution. 
And we conducted this research because we wanted to find out how they could contribute to developing a high performance digital education ecosystem. Now we found that there are many out there at higher education institutions disposal. And um, so we reviewed 23 and um, each one by uh, two members of the consortium. And we had um, you know, a set of criteria that we used to review them, which you can see on the right hand side of the screen. So, you know, we wanted to find out um, you know, what languages they were available in, if they were used for internal review or external review, and um, what key themes they looked at, if there was a, a fee required, if they helped um, institutions with um, interpreting results, and if they provided a score, for example. Um, these are just a few of the criteria. And uh, as you can see here, <laughs> um, there are a range of instruments that we included in the, the final desk research report. So we included 20 and they're all named on the right hand side of the screen. I'm sure you're familiar with, with some of them. Uh, some of them are European instruments, such as DigComp Edu, DigComp Org, HE Innovate, to name but a few. Um, there are some national instruments in there as well and as, as well as international instruments uh, coming from North America or Asia or even uh, Australia. And in this report, we uh, include an overview and summary of our findings. We also include guidelines on how to choose one of these instruments because there are so many <laughs> out there. And uh, we also include tips on how to carry out such an ass assessment with one of these instruments. And uh, at the end of this report, we have an appendix with a page uh, dedicated to each instrument and we can put the link in the chat after. <laughs> so what did we find then? Well these instruments are really useful for higher education institutions for a number of, number of reasons. So they help facilitate uh, structured conversations on how to reframe institutional strategies and um, many of them actually require um, evidence uh, gathering like data gathering um, and so this supports evidence-based strategy development. Each instrument uh, focuses on a, a variety of themes. I'd say on average, each instrument maybe focuses on 10 different themes or areas, and not always the same ones, of course, but there are some very common ones, such as policy and governance, um, curriculum assessment, professional development, um, to name but a few. And in terms of reaching out to um, vulnerable groups or um, maybe disadvantaged groups of learners, we found that some of the instruments did actually focus on this. And in fact, many instruments focus on inclusive and accessible online uh, learning environments and online learner supports. Um, some, for example, focus on lifelong learning, continuing education. Uh, others focus on, for example, disability services, whereas others might focus on empowering learners or accessibility and usability. Um, in terms of uh, the use uh, of these instruments, some of them support internal review or external review uh, or a combination of both. Uh, some actually provide guidance in the form of case studies or recommended resources. And some um, provide very kind of structured feedback in the form of a, a report. And uh, last but not least, there is a lot of potential for sharing results and benchmarking uh, results. Um, and this can be very helpful in terms of stimulating uh, discussion and change. So we found out that these uh, instruments are extremely useful, but are they actually being used is another question. So uh, they are, of course, being used, but um, we have found that there is actually limited uptake of these instruments. And so Michael told you about our survey, and one of the questions um, in the survey looked at the use of such instruments or tools. And as you can see, only 12% of the respondents to our survey anyway, which was very representative of um, the European higher education area, um, only 12% had used such a, an instrument before. And those who haven't uh, had mixed um, attitudes towards the use of such an instrument. Um, so why is this? Um, I mean, there are several reasons. It could just be that there is limited awareness of such instruments, um, perhaps they don't have, you know, enough staff <laughs> to carry out this review. It is, um, you know, um, it's quite an undertaking and it can involve a lot of people, sometimes a team to, to use these instruments. Um, 
it can take quite a long time as well. Uh, and some of them are fee paying, so it could be a, a paywall. Or perhaps they just don't know how to interpret their results and it can be an overwhelming task. So uh, based on our research then, we thought we would tell you just a little bit about the project, project uh, next steps. So we are conducting uh, thematic peer groups uh, on digitally enhanced learning and teaching. And it's been narrowed down to three kind of sub themes. So strategy and organizational culture, curriculum and assessment and international partnerships. And we are kicking off these um, thematic peer groups this month. And then to raise awareness about these uh, self-assessment tools and, and frameworks, we'll be uh, running a three-part uh, workshop series um, in, the, in the near future. So more information soon about that. Uh, so thank you so much uh, for having us today.